Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are, and welcome to our webinar, Provider Payer Convergence, The Rise of the Payvider. Hmm, that raises a question. Wow. What is a payvider? What's that? <laughs> so um, <clears throat> this is the, uh, Dr. David Nays, Chief Medical Officer of Innovator, and I'm here to moderate it. And uh, I'm very thrilled all 300 and you and growing have joined us in this webinar. So thank you very much. So I, I'm welcoming today uh, our guest, Dr. David Nash, who is the founding dean of Population Health. David, to be together. So David and David sitting side by side, outstanding. Yeah, we're actually in the same room doing this together. We've done these before, but we're very thrilled to be here with you today together in one room. Well, you remember the Heisenberg uncertainty principle from uh, high school chemistry, right? We can't possibly be in the same room <laughs> because the earth is going to change its axis of rotation. Right? And that seems to be the That's question the around question. pay binder. Exactly Can right. you get a provider and a payer together there you go. without everything exploding in the universe? Perfect analogy. Yes, exactly. So once again, uh, welcome. So let's step back for a second and say, what's the historic role of a payer and a provider and a patient? What do they each do, David? What are the traditional 20 years back role? Wow, well, first of all, once again, David Nace, great great to be together. And thanks too for all of our listeners taking time out in their busy work day with just uh, three weeks left in the whole year. Pretty incredible. So look, you and I have been around a long time and I certainly trained as you did you in a pretty traditional way where the role of the provider and the role of the payer were totally separate and distinct and was that way for decades. And I think the whole purpose of our coming together today is to ask some interesting questions about as this crazy marketplace evolves, uh, what do we see as the confluence, interesting, of these two historically disparate roles? And historically, of course, uh, most insurance companies were bill payers, and the biggest one, of course, was uh, Medicare, and not as a company, but of course, as a key part of the federal government. And you think about Medicare as a payer, that's a billion dollars every day of the year, hmm. part A and part B. Pretty incredible when you think about it that way. The top five for-profit managed care companies, and now they don't want to be called insurance companies that's anymore, right. <laughs> you know, uh, they're all in the Fortune 500. Amazing. Amazing, right. And if anybody's paying attention to the stock value of these five, where they've been in the last two years, pretty incredible. So I hope all of our listeners have these five companies in their portfolios. But seriously, I and uh, the payers were in a highly regulated industry with a 15%, uh, you know, 85%, 15% medical loss ratio. They were in the business of paying bills and minimizing cost, minimizing sometimes access and all the historical issues. And providers, look, we took a sworn oath to do the best we could for every patient. And that worked pretty well, hmm. mostly. Political party or whatever persuasion, pretty clear to me. Current system, pretty un untenable for the future. And as Americans, we have to look in the mirror and think about what well, we've got average life expectancy in reverse gear. Mm. Uh, we know in a city like Philadelphia, and everybody knows this by now, you know, your zip code determines your life expectancy, mm. right? Social determinants those, of health. Those pesky social determinants mm. that our college and uh, others brought to the fore now a decade ago. And, and uh, I think the patient's role, let me summarize, I, my three millennial children will never purchase health care the way my baby boomer wife and I purchased care, for sure not. So uh, everything's changing at once, which is pretty incredible. All these tectonic plates are shifting simultaneously. Amazing. So one of the things we hear about in that journey, at least for providers, is that most healthcare systems like Jefferson have been making a decision whether they move to value-based care in a very forceful strategic way, or they say, well, I'll just dabble in it. And this is a recent survey from Pennsylvania Consulting, which basically said 40% of healthcare leaders have made the strategic move to move forward into value-based care. Wow, I don't know who uh, Pennsylvania Consulting has spoken to. <laughs> uh, my seat of the pants, based on my travels every week to some amazing place in our great country, I would say it's less than that, mm. but okay, uh, how exciting. 
I think we believe it is an inexorable move from volume to value. Uh, we have certainly been at the forefront of promoting the move. Uh, I personally believe it's not going nearly as fast as certainly I would like and others around the country. I think the policy community in general terms believes it hasn't moved nearly fast enough. And we'll get into the details as to the why and why not. But wow, 40%, okay, well, that's a data point worth hearing about. Absolutely. Well, I think strategic move is different than actual ah, operational yes. implementation. Strategic move could be the CEO has said so. Yes. And she's committed. <laughs> right. That's, that's, a, exactly that's right. a strategic move. So that brings up this question. We've been hearing this term pay provider. Like, does it mean entering into a shared saving upside? Does it mean taking on more risk with downside? Does it mean, which many people refer to it as a provider-owned insurance company or health plan like right. Geisinger and Kaiser, or does it mean some of these newer models of collaboration? Right. So, well, it's a great question. Uh, you know, frankly, and I we'll certainly get feedback from our wonderful colleagues who are listening, I, I'm not sure what the answer is at the moment. And um, when I first heard this term, which I could pinpoint luncheon earlier this past summer, hmm. and so and I thought, what the heck is that? <laughs> uh, so it's a relatively new term. And then once I heard that back in June or July, I heard it more and more throughout the fall and in my travels. Uh, I think the way you outlined it, it's, it's probably a piece of all of the above. I have to admit, when I first heard the term, I thought it was a provider owning an insurance plan of some size or shape. And <clears throat> I think that's probably, if we could call it that, the traditional payvider, if yes, there is such a thing. Exactly. Maybe a better term would be the inaugural payvider use of the term. The construct that I thought it was, was providers owning an insurance plan of some kind. Correct. Uh, but I think you, well, the way you describe it, all kinds of new models, joint ventures, that's probably going to be the enduring meaning of this term. Mm. You know, it's our friend Glenn Steele told me the other day, you know, a lot of providers don't like the term. Right. Because the... Sure. <laughs> well, no one's going to argue with Glenn Steele, certainly not in public. <laughs> uh, but, you know, clearly Glenn is an amazing leader, surgeon, former CEO of Geisinger. You, you know, he had been in every major role in our industry. And I think when he got to Geisinger and really understood the power of owning your own plan, you plowed, right you plowed right in because the incentives were aligned and we'll come back to that. Absolutely. But I do think moving forward, I like your notion. It's a very flexible term. Let's call it that. One of my team members said it was a catchy phrase. Catchy phrase, indeed. That's nice. So they face a lot of challenges, right? When providers, health systems, and you've had this experience, Jefferson, you've started to stand up yes. an insurance company for your own employees. Yes. You've done the ACO upside, and right. I was on your board, and then right. downside. So what are the kind of challenges do you think folks face? Well, well, so I think there's a couple of things, and let's be clear about Jefferson Health. So let's just to take a moment since we're sitting in the belly of the beast, so to speak. Uh, so we're at, I uh, lost track, at uh, 16 hospitals, uh, $5 billion in revenue, it, all within the last five years. And remember, you know, you're talking to the old guy, right? I've been here 30 years come January, i.e. next month. And five years ago, we were still just two hospitals in the right. last, five. it's amazing, amazing right? Amazing. So all kudos to our fearless leader, modern healthcare, you know, top 10, Steve Clasco. So, but we still don't own a health plan. Mm. Now we are lusting mm. after one, uh, and we're hoping that will come to fruition, but we are now a major self-insured entity, mm -hmm. right? So we're at risk for the 35,000 employees. Mm. So to some extent, I like to tell people, well, we are our own ACO, mm. right? In addition to owning half well, MSSP, uh, ACO along with so what are the challenges well I think um, coming to grips just as we say here with the new incentive models uh, we need a different kind of provider hopefully we'll get into that certainly anybody my age ain't going to be somebody you're after to be in this kind of arrangement uh, we want to connect with patients in an entirely new way and we want to have as Dr. Clasco says care everywhere that's right so uh, we got to engage because you know my 28 uh, year old son he's never going to pick up the phone call a doctor make an appointment I mean, it's laughable uh, he never calls his parents why would he call the doctor oh, as Dr. Clasco often says Jefferson the health system should be on his phone. You, you bet 
everywhere yeah. on your phone instantly. Absolutely. And guess what? I know uh, this morning we passed 140,000 telemedicine visits so wow. far. And we have some interesting data with our colleague Judd Hollander that really does show, you know, we've, we've uh, prevented a lot of folks from going to the expensive discoordinated emergency room. Mm -hmm. And we've kept them in the system. So, uh, you know, we're, we're getting, we're, we know what the challenges are. And I think um, all forward thinking provider groups are asking the questions that you and I are talking about here today. And I know both Steve and you have been helping us at Innovacer thinking through this issue that if you're going to do this right, right. buy 12 hospitals. What does it mean? You need data, you need you technology, you need to help to make automate workflows to get efficiency. Well, clearly, you, you know, whatever, whether you're Epic, Cerner, All Scripts, or, you know, Man in the Moon, um, that's still an electronic chart. Mm. It's not actionable information, mm. right? And we could quibble for sure. You got to have the tool, but to go from data to information, well, that's that's really what innovation is all about. And you cannot face these challenges without going through that journey. And everybody working on the same. Tool. Oh well, that uh, goes without saying. Absolutely. You got to be on the same platform. Absolutely. So there's a lot of work to do to achieve this sort of alignment, this kind of collaboration with payers. Um, this is another survey from. Catalyst that was published in New England Journal of Medicine and like are your payers and providers aligned? Not so much. Not so much. Well, I think this uh, this could be a, a representation of the Philadelphia market. <laughs> and you, you know, I, I like to remind folks not only are we four blocks from the Liberty Bell where you and I are sitting right now, right, and the founding city of our great country, but today, you know, healthcare is the biggest business in this entire region, mm. right? Uh, we have uh, uh, four major medical schools, two of which are walking distance from one another, right? If you take uh, Sydney Kimmel Medical College, Jefferson, and uh, that's 5% of America's work and training right here. Mm -hmm. And of course, we also have the distinction now of having the first major bankruptcy of a academic medical center hospital, Hahnemann. Mm -hmm. So what's the point? The point is that, um, we got a lot going on in healthcare in our town, and achieving alignment of payer and provider ain't one of them. Right, that makes sense. Well, let's go ahead and kind of turn back to our audience. We've got about 500 people online right now. How exciting. Uh, yeah, it's very exciting. And one of the questions we'd like to do is ask <coughs> you, in your markets, in your the places you work each day, what degree of collaboration do you see existing within your networks between payers and providers? So you have four choices. Uh, you actually share those actionable insights in real time on a technology platform. Maybe you share your data according to the need of the payer or the provider. Maybe you barely interact with each other, send each other a report once a year and say, why don't you get your act together? Or you're just completely working blindly in silos. So let's go ahead and open that poll. And while we're waiting for the people to respond, David, you mentioned the Sydney Kimmel Center. I want to yeah. congratulate you at Jefferson on your recent. Uh, uh, thank you. Yes. Well, uh, Sydney and his wife, Caroline, uh, who live in California, but last Thursday night at a 1,200 person dinner, uh, I was excited to learn, like everybody else, of their additional $70 million commitment. Pretty incredible. Wow. Pretty good for a South Philly boy, you know, who yeah, made good. Not bad. Uh, not bad. And that's going to be to the Carolyn Kimmel research building, hmm. which will be added on to the Blumley building and the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center hmm. on our campus across the street from where you and I are sitting. So, you know, um, it, we're going to end up with two major and uh, National uh, Cancer Institute research centers in this town, us and Penn. Hmm. That's amazing. Yep. Yeah, and that is the frontier. <clears throat> and, you know, as we talk about this pair provider collaboration, you know, who knows what that means? For who costs, knows? Right. right? Well, uh, right. Oh, and gosh. maybe we'll get into it. Uh, you know, Jefferson Health, uh, as an employee, I got free genetic screening this year. Wow. And I'm happy to chat in detail about that. It was a uh, low barrier to entry free. And uh, I learned some pretty amazing stuff. And uh, we thought maybe a couple of hundred employees would do it. And at 9,000 employees, it like broke the bank <laughs> of uh, getting involved with our colleagues at Color in California. Different topic. But, you know, when you're self-insured, 
uh, you would like to see your employees engaged in their own health. Yeah, right? and I understand that color through Jefferson with color has offered that to all employees. That's yeah, everybody. That's Amazing. right. Not yeah. just faculty members. Right. So I was happy to sign up and get that done. And I, I think there are some implications for the payer provider mm. potential confluence. And the United States in general. Oh, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Indeed. Well, let's go ahead and see what you, the audience, have said. So if we could bring the poll results up and take a look, that would be awesome. And so opening the curtain, <laughs> waiting, 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 says, hmm. Wow. David, what do you think of yeah, this? Yeah, this is probably reportable right yes. here. Let's write a paper. <laughs> so 53%, more than half of our listeners said we share our data according to the need. Hmm. Okay, well, that's a little bit of a surprise, higher than I would have thought. Fits more with that 40%. Sits more with the 40%. So I'm learning a lot here in the first 15 minutes. Hmm. Um, I think we barely interact. So, so I think the downside is that a quarter of the folks still don't really talk to each other, That's right. which is about what I would think. And more than 10% are still in silos. Maybe those two answers kind of go together. But it's wow, it's take curve in that way. Yeah. Yep, yep. But the outcome here, pretty uh, moving. In maybe the right we're onto something with them. Pay provider. Yeah, yeah. This is pretty cool. Okay. Well, let's go back to the webinar. So. Um, this brings up this issue. We all talk about moving into risk. Yes. What do we mean by risk? Well, so the traditional description would be, look, I, I prefer to talk about it as aligning economic incentives. You know, doctors don't like, I'm at risk for the clinical decision making. What the hell does that mean? Who wants to be at risk? Who wants to be at risk? You're at risk every day taking care of patients, mm -hmm. not just the doctors, nurses, pharmacists, everybody. So I don't really like the risk piece. What I like to say is, look, if we want to deliver evidence-based, high-quality, harm-free mm. care, what do we need? And I would argue, of course, we need all the right people on the team. We need the data and the information, and we need to align the economic incentives. It's the only way, and we have a decade of research experience to support this. It's unequivocal. It's the only way that we're going to reduce unnecessary testing, that we're going to practice based on the best available evidence, and we're gonna reduce harm. Mm. You know, you give me any clinical example, stents, uh, carotid endarterectomy, uh, inappropriate surgeries. Uh, I mean, the only way we're gonna reduce waste and get a better outcome is to align the incentives. Mm. So to me, risk for providers and payers, bringing them together, if we could align those incentives and get the care team to look in the mirror, Mm. and say, hey, what are we doing here? And what's the best practice available to us? And let's figure out how to achieve the best outcome at the best possible price and do no harm in the process. Wow, that's the holy grail. No, that makes sense. And there's a culture issue here, right? Because payers Huge. think about risk as being in premium totally risk. Totally different. Providers think about it as taking risk to take care of patients right. at their cost. Right. And also, don't forget, every practitioner I know thinks that their patients are the sickest. Of course. So I'm at the more risk than you, David Nace, right. because my patients are way sicker. And sometimes the data shows differently. And sometimes <laughs> it shows differently. And remember, again, where we're sitting in this town, you know, we, th this is um, uh, woven into the daily part of what we do every day. Mm -hmm. Meaning, you know, we believe that clinically speaking, we have the sickest patients and topic for another time. Absolutely. But I think the key is once payers and providers come to terms with, you need to take some degree of accountability, yes. skin in the game. Right. I like that more. Yes. Skin in the game. Then I think we can start to all come together in terms of what we're talking about. You bet. And I would add transparency and accountability. Yes. So to me, you know, these watchwords, literally these watchwords, mm. haven't changed since 1918 when a bunch of surgeons, amazing, right? A bunch of surgeons got together to form the American College of Surgeons mm -hmm. at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in Park Avenue. And they were all about accountability and um, transparency. And so you could say it's 100 years later, mm. we're still talking about many of the same issues. But to really be accountable and to really be transparent is incredibly hard work. Very difficult and risky. And risky, <laughs> indeed. And look at the you know newspaper today. You know, other than impeachment and all that, you know, the Trump administration on the healthcare side is pushing. You know, 
price transparency. That's not what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I'm about transparency for outcome. Yeah. Price is a secondary and issue. And your performance. And your performance. That's right. right. You bet. So this is a traditional kind of role of how to balance that, right? So, you know, people have moved from fee-for-service to shared saving upside and then downside. And some have done bundle payments. We've seen this shared risk. And now we're talking about pay, vader, pay buyers right. here today in your office. Right. Um, you know, a lot of folks are saying, well, I don't know that I want to go all in. You've talked about two canoes. Or right, the two foot. canoes. Yep, yeah. yep. You, ban, you got one foot in each and they're going in opposite directions. <laughs> yeah, so what do you think about this concept of evolving? Into well, I really like this step diagram. Listeners have seen something like this, but they probably haven't seen an ending on the far right with the pay vider oh, structure. That's new. That's new. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm enamored of this, and, and we could quibble whether you own the health plan or it's a joint venture. I, I think we are going to see evolution in the far right part of this diagram, mm -hmm. and it's going to take multiple shapes and multiple sizes. I mean, when I think about my self as a board member of Humana, um, you know, that's an amazing company on lots of levels, not the least of which is looking for clinical partners because they know that the answer is the further down the road to risk with a clinical partner, the more cost effective the care that's delivered. Hmm. I mean, that's an axiom that has proven time and time again to be true, and Humana's market value. Uh, I think reflects that, as does uh, Aetna, Anthem, United. I'm not picking on any one of these, but in the for-profit world, there is no question that they've aligned these economic incentives with certain clinical partners, and where they've done so, it's been a win for everybody. Hmm. And you know, we could get into the weeds, and I know there's strong feelings about some of these firms. I get it, but the research evidence is very compelling, as is the research evidence for. Uh, on the public side for Medicare Advantage. Well, you cannot argue against how effective Medicare Advantage is. No, absolutely. And, and David, as you know, you know, Innovacer has a partnership with Humana as well right. in the Medicare Advantage space right. in which we're helping them share data and insights it's amazing, between isn't it? the provider and payer. And that's really where the rubber hits well, the Well, I think historically, David, especially when you and I trained, the only people who really knew that who had the data were the people who paid the claims. That's right. Right. And had all the data. And had they had all the data. In the rear view mirror. In right. the rear view mirror. And then in our negotiation, now I'm speaking as a provider, it's a schizophrenic existence, of course. When you think about decades worth of negotiating with some of the major payers in our market, they owned the data. Yes. We were in a very difficult situation not really, uh, certainly not as an equal. No, but a file cabinet of what you only did. Uh, exactly right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and you know, it's funny, Elizabeth and I, your assistant, was not, were joking that you and I still use paper, but no, none of the young people we work yes, with do. Yes, well, so. don't date us too badly here. <laughs> right. Well, we are moving into that electronic world, and that has opened up these huge opportunities. And so the big pay provider pay market opportunity is, you know, we're on track to moving toward these value-based models, yes. which require data sharing. We have Medicare Advantage. I'd like to talk a little bit about right. that. And I'm going to interrupt you on the second bullet. That's now one-third of all Medicare beneficiaries are in MA plans right now. Wow. So this is a growth trajectory. Yeah, and as you and I were saying, it will exceed commercial. Yes, I, I think we'll be around to see that. Yeah, because the older folks like you and I are kind of moving into that, you know, you bet. pocket. So especially, uh, I think about this a lot. This year, I'm one year away from Medicare mm. eligibility. Yikes. Uh, so I've been thinking about, wow, what's this going to be like? Mm. And of course, having been born in 1955, the Z Zenith year for all boomers. That's they're all together one more year from now. We are going to crush the Medicare budget, mm. right? Because I'm going to want right. Canyon Ranch, That's baby. Right. <laughs> and I'm going to want a whirlpool and a jacuzzi yeah. in the nursing home. Yeah, with the view of the canyon. With the view right. of the canyon and Canyon <laughs> Ranch food, too. That's right. That's right. That's right. So, um, and then also we talked about provider sponsored health plans. And I understand from reading 300 or more currently health systems have their own insurance company. That is a surprise to That's me. That's shocking. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's a third lesson for me so far today. I, I would have put it at half that number. Uh, Two and, years ago, yeah. 120. Okay. Now it's 300. There you go. Yeah. 
so that makes sense and I think reflects, you know, where we're going in the marketplace. Right. Pre so, pretty incredible. So let's step back and talk about Medicare Advantage. What is the big attraction outside of you and I wanting to go to Canyon Ranch? What is yeah. the big attraction? Well, I think it brings together it's Uncle Sam's HMO. Hmm. That's how I explain it at the thing. Um it, it and it um explicit attention to what we haven't chatted about yet, which are the social determinants. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you sign up for MA, you could have transportation, you could have a food benefit, you get care coordination, you, you get vision, you know, um, and the for-profit plans are competing like crazy mm -hmm. to get these folks because of the change in reimbursement, higher margin, and what's this all about? So it's all about going upstream to shut the faucet mm. rather than mopping up the floor. Meaning, let's improve nutrition in the elderly. So this is Tivity and Nutrisystems as mm. a great example. Let's um, reduce loneliness because we know loneliness leads to depression, leads to dementia. So what would you rather do? Put you know, grandma in a uh, senior center during the day so she can meet other seniors or go pay for her dementia two years from now when she's alone in her mm -hmm. apartment you know look so hospitals don't have these incentives right you know I like to tell people you know my late mother god bless her um, her managed care plan sent folks to her home in Southeast Florida when after my dad died to get the rug out of her bathroom, hmm. right? Well, can you imagine a hospital system doing that? You know, there's a part of me, which I have to control, that thinks, you know, they would like to do exactly the opposite, That's right. That's you know? Right. <laughs> right. So we won't talk about that. <laughs> <No>. But but <laughs> if my economic incentives are aligned, I, I'm going to send all kinds of people to Mrs. Jones at yeah, home. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to engage with her across the spectrum of care mm -hmm. with the goal of going upstream, shutting that faucet rather than my. They're looking at the refrigerator, ah, looking at the shoebox with the meds, all yeah, that stuff. Well, now I can get into, you know, Mrs. Jones, you know, what are all these pills <laughs> and what's going on here? And how come nobody else is here? And Why do you have three flights oh, of stairs please, and you just broke it? Don't head, even, right? I mean, right. And so I think there's a great market opportunity, nicely illustrated okay. in this slide for sure. Awesome. And we'll get to joint ventures in a you second. You bet. So, you know, these new skill sets we talked a little bit about, you go into the world of the insurance uh, company, boy. which learns right. premiums, it's a whole new world of competency. It's yeah. not doing an ACO, it's beyond that. Oh, way beyond. So I have a diagnostic question. Mm. Uh, see what folks think when we have the opportunity to get some feedback. Um, I like to ask, integrated delivery systems or clinically integrated networks excuse me um how many actuaries do you employ that's what's an actuary? what's an actuary <laughs> is the usual answer right? right so i'm poking fun i don't mean to but yeah. i think you're right additional competencies yes and you have them nicely laid out here you, you know i think there's lots of uh, casualties on the road of uh providers trying to become insurance companies, yes. which is why I think, and we'll get to it, these joint ventures might be really the model moving forward. We're in totally different businesses with totally different competencies and skill sets. Mm. To think that a hospital leadership team is going to overnight throw a switch and become an expert insurance risk bearer, that ain't happening. That's right. Let alone just dealing with the regulatory Oh, my goodness. Oh, that. not going to happen. Right. So we have these new collaboration models beginning to evolve. You know, traditionally, you know, the responsibility of delivering care has been the provider, the responsibility of providing that insurance is the insurer. But we've now talked about not only insurance plans within health systems, but also joint ventures. So what are some of these new models? What's bringing them about? Well, I think it's the market exigencies, uh, the capital required, the skill sets that we just talked about. It's just a lower barrier to entry to create a joint venture mm. and then carve out, if you would, a population, whether it's an MA population, a Medicaid population, a dual eligible, or do it by disease state. I, I don't care how you slice and dice it, but I think the it's just lower barrier to entry to create these joint ventures. Uh, much, And I think it allows the experts to good at. Mm. Uh, the complicating variable are the docs, the nurses, and the pharmacists. So who are there, you know, who's the employer, right? Uh, how is the team structured? And then do the actual people who deliver the care 
how do they share mm. in the upside and how do they bear the risk on the downside? And that requires transparency uh, and collaboration. Yeah, we, as going back to 1918. Amazing. Um, you know, this is not brand new this year, and there's been a couple of folks that have ventured into this joint venture. I think we know that you know, some years ago, Aetna began to do narrow network partnering with, you know, groups like Innova, and then we started to see the initial joint venture with Anthem, with, with Aurora Health, but let's kind of go into a little bit of these. So this is in your backyard, yes, Pennsylvania. Yes, our good friends. Geisinger and Highmark has, have formed a joint venture covering four county region in Clinton, Lancona, Sullivan, and Tioga County. Sure, so it's about yeah. three and a half hours from where we're sitting, uh -huh. and you know, our colleagues at Geisinger are amazing. They really are. And uh, J. Wan Ru, the new CEO, of course, has roots in uh, two major managed care plans, Kaiser and Humana, of mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but these are experts. Yeah. This is their core business. This is not the average two bears coming together in a joint venture. So I think it's uh, wonderful. It's probably a great barometer and a great symbol of where the market's going, but it's not broadly applicable. No, that makes sense. And as you, just to point out for the group, I mean, Geisinger has had their own insurance company for quite for some sure, time. So sure. they've learned how to do these competencies. Right. They understand that oh, they get doing this. this joint venture is a lot easier. Yeah. And to your previous point about the, I would call it the culture of clinical practice, there is no question in my mind that the Geisinger clinicians, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, everybody, well, they have a very different culture than we have at Jefferson Health. And I'm not labeling one good or bad, it's just different because to survive and thrive in a plan risk-bearing environment is very different than what we have certainly in our center city campus. And I would think for most uh, health systems, which are principally hospitals, they would agree that you, you can't create a Geisinger culture hmm. overnight in a typical provider organization. That's right. And, you know, it's a, a point we haven't talked about, nor will much in this, um, you know, Highmark had their uh, little forte into buying some provider groups. Uh, indeed, in the foray people. to buying a couple of hospitals, right. and we're going to see more of this. So they have some experience on that side of the fence, indeed. too. So again, it helps to bring them together a little right. bit So those easier. are two very experienced shops. So here's another one, and we were both talking about Yeah, Craig I, I like Samet. this example, yeah. and our great friend, uh, Craig Samet, you, you know, I think this is exciting. A blues plan and a provider going public about their partnership, cool. That's awesome. I think you're gonna see more of this. And, you know, and again, it is in Minnesota, so everybody's nice to each other, you know. And, <laughs> and they've had a head start. And they have had a huge head start, <laughs> going back to Paul Elwood, you know, in 1972. That's right. So, okay, I get it, it's Minnesota. But, um, wow, if we pretty excited. A lot of credit. And if they could make a go of it, boy, I, I'd like to get under the hood and take a look at how this is really working. Yeah, and I think, you know, both you and I know Craig, and so, you know, Craig had his own experience running a leading ed pay for performance for their providers, providers right. and then moved to right. lead a health system, health system. at Anthem. Right. And then, so he's had both the right sides guy. of the experience. He, he was gets the it. right guy to do he this. He speaks pay provider. That's right, that's right. Um, and then one more example is Anthem and Aurora yeah. Health. Well, again, I think, uh, you know, Wisconsin, lots of innovation in this part of the world. We've got to keep that in mind. Aurora itself has had explosive growth, right, in the last five years. I've been there twice myself uh, to work with the physician leaders. Anthem, one of those five we talked about earlier in the program. So these are two experts. So no surprise to me that they're finding a way to uh, carve out some of this and, again, align the economic incentives and the Aurora provider in all shapes and sizes. Mm. There's not a single type of Aurora provider. Now, so these are all three great, ex you know, examples. These are wonderful stories. Great by the stories way, of how payers and providers can come together in new and unique ways. And I think, you know, as they do that, what do you think their goals are? What do they need to accomplish in these joint Wow. Measures? Yeah. Well, that's a really great question, and I, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in some of these negotiations. And in our marketplace, I, I have a hunch early in 2020, you're going to see at least two payvider organizations being born. So uh, we're not at liberty to say exactly who, but uh, trust me, 
I think at least two that I'm aware of and am directly involved in. We'll keep we'll keep an eye watching. Keep an eye, absolutely. So what are the you know what are the challenges? Well, you know, again, align the economic incentives. We got to reduce waste. We got to look in the mirror mm. and ask ourselves some difficult questions. You know, what's our principal business? Are we about keeping people healthy? Do we really want to reduce utilization? Right? I mean, we got compete once again, go upstream and shut that down. But look, um, we're always going to have, is it a $14 or $16? That's right. We're always going to have that. And I wish we could put that in the rear view mirror because what I want to know is why are we spending that in the first damn place? That's right. Right? It's a totally different question. Is this procedure worth X dollars or X minus? This Y dollars. Who gives a damn? The real question is need this procedure. And how come she's showing up in the ER with this diabetic foot ulcer that you could have taken care of two months ago at home, but you didn't have the economic incentives or the team to do it? That's much, the key question. It's a much better conversation. Is I'm not paid enough. My patients are sicker. And oh, by the way, God. I think you're gaming me. Oh, man. <laughs> you know, as a lot of my friends know, when I came to Jefferson in 1990, I was six feet, two and a half inches tall, David Nace. <laughs> right, and now I, I, I think five, I, six. I think I knew you back then. Yeah, but yeah at I five, six. You know, this will wear you down right. having this conversation yeah. just like that. It's awful. So let's go back and ask our nice break to take a look at our audience and and say, you know, what are the top barriers that you see in kind of bringing together the clinical and financial aspects as we think about these collaborations within your organization, like? Do you need more collaboration from, quote unquote, the other side? Yeah. Do you not have the right technology in place to be able to, you know, be able to automate and be able to address the issues you need to do? Do you not have the right data? Are you not sharing? Is it mm -hmm. part of that collaboration? Do you not have a mechanism? Is the big barrier the social determinants, right? If right. you're going to move into MA, do you not have that capability? Right. Well, so let's um, let's go ahead and ask our audience that question. But, you know, I think you brought up a, an interesting standpoint, you know, here in Philadelphia, it's a very different environment to operate than, say, up north in Danville, Pennsylvania, where guys totally have been. Right. So how do you think about this regionally? Because I know across the country, the degree of which payers, providers are not only coming together, but get along or the issues. How do you yeah. see that landscape? Well, I can't speak to every market, certainly not. But look, in the big metropolitan areas, so I was just in Chicago a day ago and Philly, Chicago, probably not Los Angeles, not a good example. Uh, certainly New York, Washington, D.C., Baltimore. Look, on the East Coast, we're learning how to do this, right? Most change, especially as it relates to payvider evolution, let's call it, mm. this, this tsunami is coming from West Coast to East Coast, just like capitation did, just like ACO. We're, we're not culturally, clinically speaking, we're not culturally there yet, and we don't know how to really manage risk. We don't even like the word, as we've discussed already. Mm -hmm. But I do think the change is going to come. It's just coming from west to east. Got it. Well, this is, I think, for everybody. They're in a different market. They've got different relationships. Let's go ahead and see what our poll results are. And I'm always intrigued by this because markets just, to me, are fascinating. Yeah, well, especially when we have a national audience like we have. It's fantastic. Yeah, we've got 500 people. So somewhere they're representing most of the market, we hope. Hmm. So let's see. The results. Well, pretty exciting. So, okay, uh, makes sense. We need more collaboration. You know, you cannot over communicate. So that's at least a third of the answers. 13% um, say they don't have the technical capability. I think that's probably a low estimate. Yeah. Uh, we don't have or share the right data. So this, look at this. I mean, it's sort of almost evenly distributed. Um, really interesting. We do not have a mechanism to address the social determinants. Well, you know, clearly we here at the College of Population Health, we spend probably inordinate time on the social determinants. Mm -hmm. And look, it's vexing. I get it. Doctors, nurses, and pharmacists don't see themselves as social workers, right? Mm -hmm. But what does the research show? So, you know, we're aware of some pretty new work that says when you give primary care doctors, especially family medicine internists, when you give them tools to deal with number four here, this, those social determinants, you actually reduce burnout, mm -hmm. right? Because you know it's the day-to-day -day frustration of we know Mrs. Jones is going to come back, we know she has no money, we know she has bad 
There was no food in the refrigerator. Lack but of I've not been trained to but deal not, with anything. That's not my that's thing. That's not my business. Right. That's not my But thing. if I'm in a team where I have people to help and mm. address the behavioral health overlay on all of this, mm. you know, wow. So these answers, not as surprising as the first poll. But the technical capability is an that's interesting huge. one because that, right. without that, you're not going right. to really get So let's add hard. up two and three. I would say, so what is that? 35% don't have the right technical or data if I'm going to add those two together. Yep. That That's, sounds about right. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that because I think that is a key piece that we need to start thinking about as we move into these environments. So technology is critical in doing any of this. And, you know, certainly here at Jefferson, you've done a lot around technology. As I go around the country, we see that when we start talking about these pay buyer collaboration models, they really need to move beyond this, I send you a bill, you pay it. Oh, totally. Well, we want real-time closure of the feedback loop to practitioners. Mm. We want tools to close the so-called gaps in care. Mm. Um, you, you know, th this is not a new lesson. We, we go back and look at the work of uh, Brent James, our colleague, mm. right? Sure. Who 40 years ago, it's not an exaggeration, he was looking at these issues, closing the feedback loop with physicians, giving them good information in a timely, non-punitive way mm -hmm. about their performance relative to a peer group and in comparison to national norms. You know, no doctor wants to be on the wrong end of that bell curve. No. You know, and, and certainly, but most of the time, we don't have on where we're going and what we're doing. Yep. And gets we, us to the whole notion of the registry function and all the rest. And we talk a lot about, there's so many tasks that exists that could be automated and oh. so much friction oh, that can yeah. be brought out well, with this connectivity. That's another issue which is sort of embedded in here, which is the downside of the technology from an individual practitioner perspective. And look, I get it. I do not make my living in direct patient care, neither mm -hmm. do you. So I really feel for our clinical colleagues who are at the front lines. I, I, my heart goes out to them. The systems are cumbersome. Mm -hmm. I know people go home and do hours of online ah, clicking charting, and clacking. Yeah. You know, I, I am very sympathetic. Uh, on, on the other hand, we got to get to the next evolutionary step with this technology. Mm -hmm. As my father used to say, um, his primary care doctor of 30 years, he said, David, my, my doctor doesn't talk to me anymore. I said, no, yeah. come on now. I know Joel. Right, like, what's right. going on? He goes, no, no. He's, right. he's staring at the what's screen. What's he doing? He's busy in the computer. Right. He, like, he did not understand it had anything to do with it. Right. Well, you know, this, we could take a whole uh, detour here. But what I love uh, that really, when you tell people outside of our industry, so, you know, now we've hired scribes. So we've gone <laughs> back to the Middle Ages. To enter into to the, enter the EMR. To enter into the EMR. <laughs> to me, that's like, you got to be kidding, right? I think that says it all about where are we going here? The know? wrong direction. Oh, God. Right. So if we can really connect everybody, like we're connected with our phones, if we can start automating a lot of things that currently don't need to have manual labor applied to them, if we can reduce the friction, you have a lot of you to access what you need to access right away, right. Right. as you say with Jefferson, you know, have care everywhere. Care have, everywhere. Care everywhere. Right. I think that would now, really be. Now imagine three, five years from now, David, when care everywhere includes our deep knowledge about your social determinants. Absolutely. And I've applied artificial intelligence and subset machine learning to your issues. So when you connect with us, I know that, you know, this critter doesn't own a car, so we better figure out where you're going to get your care, as an example. Amazing. So this is our view of sort of a connected care framework here at Innovator. We think about having all of these sources, and these are just some on the left, right? Primary care, hospitals, health plans, could be labs, uh, could be social determinant data, but all these forms of data that are relevant, the nursing home, the um, you know, the, the pharmacy should all come into some form of cloud. We all use cloud, right? We right. have our phones and being right. able to have that useful, trustable information because the yeah. data we get on this and to be able to create these automated tools. Yeah, well, so it's a good time for us to remind everybody only two industries have not been able to demonstrate increases in productivity, higher education and healthcare. And here we are at Jefferson's College of Population Health, right, right in the midst of both of those. So uh, it's a real challenge. This is an idealized version. I can only say I hope I live to see it.
Uh, well, we may be able to we show We may be you. able to. I hope, so. I hope so. So uh, this is a little slide just to say we've already kind of gone a little bit into this, but, you know, this is so important that that data isn't just doctor data, health plan data, and hospital data. Right. It's this other forms of data. Right. So here, here's what I would say to, uh, this is a great slide. I know we're going to be there when I write a prescription for a patient for food mm. and they go to the food bank and the director of the food bank says, how easy or difficult was it for you to get to us today? Right? And then I'll know that we are we're really we're we paid attention to these social determinants. So mm -hmm. part one, I have the option to write the script for food. And part two, the food bank is working with us to close the feedback loop. Mm -hmm. When we achieve that, boy, that that'll be fantastic. And that's a form of partnership beyond just payer provider. Totally. That's payer provider community. But if my economic incentives are aligned, you know, maybe I'll invest in that food bank. That's right. Right. And mm -hmm. maybe I'll have uh, an employee there whose job it is is to check on these social determinants and ask these difficult questions. Incredible. And they are such a major driver of outcomes. That's, uh, that's the piece we often lose sight of. So, you know, we need to have not just a connection, a connected care framework, but we need to start also getting smart, right? We have this in other forms, like I can predict my financial situation over the next year in a couple of scenarios. Sure, in the spreadsheet and the yeah. sensitivity analysis and all that. Absolutely, yep. so how do we think about that in healthcare? Yeah, well, I think you gotta have the, the platform. We, we, we don't have the platform. I know Innovation's working hard to create this right now, but without that platform, it's not gonna be possible no, and to you need, ask those kinds of questions. And you need predictive models. So just like with the um, Medicare Shared Savings Program, which right. most people know, and they've been looking at forward risk. Yeah. And you know, we at Innovator have done a social vulnerability risk to, cool. to identify. And then we were also thinking about future risk, saying, what does this predict for the future? I think having a smart platform, not just a connected platform, yeah. is the right But once again, um, if you don't have an aligned economic incentive and you have the social determinant data, I would guess that would be very frustrating to providers. That's right. Yeah. But it's not an and or, mm. it's an and. You, you got to have the tools, collect the data which will lead to the actionable information and the aligned economic incentive. Otherwise, you're going to frustrate a whole generation of providers. That's right. You know, you put the technology behind somebody, if they don't have the incentives, oh, forget it's not there. It. Why would you I give them it? the incentives of the technology, they'll fail. They'll fail. Right. right. So yeah. it's, it's an ant. They have to go hand in hand. Absolutely. So this is um, just our view at Innovator, sort of what we call a data activation platform, giving kind of insights. I always cool. like to say, people, when they're driving a car and they're using Waze, they don't want to see bar graphs of average speeds of velocity. They don't want to see a <laughs> relative predictive coefficient with r square of whether or not that is truly an accident right. ahead based no, on don't. police report triangulation with speed right. slowdown right. they just want to know what to what do what to do indeed yep well and, it's a great analogy uh, definitely a good analogy i think and they want to be able to trust it so we've all made that's why i like this analogy we've all that made that mistake of trying to fool i know better right. than my google maps right yeah. i'm going to go straight cuz i don't think that's right or yeah. i know a shortcut Oh boy. And we usually find out because we're given choice, right? The HMO Arena didn't give choice Correct. initially, but we were given choice and we get to learn to trust. And Correct. that's what's key. Well, I would say, so the, I like this data activation platform. I think there's one, more than one, but one topic we didn't cover, which I, I want to come back to before we take questions. Let's and that, that. that is, uh, what's the role of the specialist? I mean, the, I've been focused on the primary care doctors, nurses, pharmacists, the team, but, you, you know, when I refer somebody to that cardiologist and she, you know, doesn't get back to me, orders a bunch of unnecessary tests, that that's not going to work in a payvider, multi-specialty you know, joint venture, mm. you know. Mm. So mm. for these, and I'm addressing the joint venture now, for these joint ventures to work, we better have providers of all sizes and shapes specialists and primary care who get it right otherwise we're going to be back to where we were with the gatekeeper role and specialists with no skin in the game um and number one and number two david when we get to these payvider models 
we're going to have to look in the mirror and say not every specialist is going to be welcomed that's right into the tent right um in fact uh, i would argue probably half of them aren't going to be in that tent because for all kinds of good reasons they don't get back they're poor communicators they're profligate testers they have a lousy outcome mm. We and are we willing? I mean, this is a Malcolm Gladwell tipping point question. Absolutely. Are we really willing to say, you know, Nace, you're not in the network, and here's five reasons why? Uh, I, I think we're there, but that's this is not for the weak need. You know, uh, it's going to be very difficult conversation we're going to have to have with some of our colleagues. Absolutely, and it'll be a tough one. So a couple questions from the audience. Okay. Just pulled these up. Um, first question for you, David. How will the provider meet the challenge of the next half century? Well, that's a big leap. Half century. <laughs> wow. of, of a significant deficit of medical providers. What a good question wow. for you. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so uh, let me give you my sense of this. Uh, and again, my reflection sitting here in Philadelphia. Look. We do not have a doctor shortage. Mm, mm. We have a primary care doctor shortage. Let's look at the world. And maybe a specialist over Okay, so we know in our great country, it's three specialists to every primary care doctor. In the wow. rest of the developed world, it's three to every specialist. So my hair is not on fire that there's not enough doctors. My hair is on fire that Medical education is too damn expensive, and all the incentives are to subspecialize. Yeah. Speaking yep. from one of the largest private medical schools in the country, Sidney Kimmel Medical College, right? So we know we need a different model here. We have to have loan forgiveness. We have to make primary care more attractive. And I mean, it's a list with 10 things on it. Here's another good question for you. A little provocative. Oh, boy. Yeah. Why would providers go down the path of aligning with payers? Mm -hmm when there is so much work that needs to be done to eliminate middlemen who are adding so many costs to the total bill in healthcare? Uh, well, as a, you know, of course, I expect a question like this and, you know, does water flow downhill? You know, that's a great question too. So yeah. look, here's the challenge. If you're in a mindset that the big five can be out of that, mm -hmm. I get it. Uh, I'm of the mindset that uh, they have been practicing population health for five years, and they've returned unbelievable value to their shareholders, mm -hmm. which is, in my opinion, what makes America really great. Mm -hmm. And they have reduced waste. They've reduced harm. They are based on the best available evidence. If you view them as a middleman, well, that's a tough one. I can't mm -hmm. talk you out of that. And maybe you can eliminate the middlemen by com combining forces and becoming one well, in many okay. different ways. Well, okay, so the upside look at this is, let's get back to pay provider. Yeah. If you're, you know, if you're really linked at the level of the wallet, you're gonna think differently and you're gonna act differently. And we know that this is true. And we know that when doctors have an aligned economic incentive, you can change the textbook of medicine and surgery. Hmm. You know, Harrison and Schwartz textbooks change when we realign the incentives of that there is it's absolutely the truth well let's go back we have time for one more last question and it's an interesting evolution of everything we've been talking about fire away so we know the biggest commercial side are the employers employers yeah so Where i don't they even know what this? to call this hybrid but how do you, what do you call an employer i call it direct call? contracting that's yes, what there i call we it go. right <laughs> but i can see so that's a wonderful question to end on so Certainly in a three-year time horizon, mm. I can see big employers, not mom and pops, mm. but national employers who are going to find not only the best provider organization, we know that happens now, right? Centers of excellence and all of that. But imagine if they can also negotiate with a national payer mm. that here are five payer provider sites, five pay providers that if your employees mm. go here, We'll lower the claims cost. We'll lower our administrative costs. 
will share in the upside. You know, there's all kinds of amazing things they'd be able to do if so, they bought wholesale. So this goes to the evolution of middlemen. Middle, so yeah. maybe pay buyers becomes the contracting entity with employers. Well, then I would accept the terminology middleman there. or middle person. Yes, that's right. right. That's middle right. person. Well, David, this has been a joy. Well, thank you, David Nace. Always great to be together. Special thanks again to all of our colleagues out there taking time out in mid-December to listen to us uh, talking about the pay provider. And well, I, I'd like to get more feedback. What do people think about this term? And uh, I, I think it's exciting. And I, I'm looking forward to the evolution of the pay provider. Absolutely. So this presentation will be emailed out to all registered email IDs, people that have joined up on this webinar and across the recording. And of course, we'll make an offer to connect with them and talk with them more about you this bet. topic and talk to them a little bit more about what we're doing at Invaser. Fantastic. Thanks again. Thank you. Everybody have a great day. Have a great holiday. And thank 